Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope this uh, lecture will be uh, sufficiently weighty for the present company. I just selected a member of the audience that I sat next to a moment ago and I had a very stimulating discussion about the role of quantum decoherence in quantum computers. And so that's uh, really, I'll have to ramp up the uh, uh, level of the lecture to suit such a distinguished audience. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, so, um, I'm standing in for uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who unfortunately got stranded by the uh, Spanish air traffic con uh, controller's strike. And what I've done, I've taken the first bit of her lecture, because I think it was already quite well advertised, and stuck it on uh, to the front of my lecture. And so we'll, we'll deal with the end of the world first and get that out of the way in a few minutes, <laughs> and then move on to, uh, as Mark uh, mentioned, the, the story about Galileo. And apparently the Mayans had a very sophisticated calendar uh, that runs in a 5,125 year cycle and that's due to end on December 21 of 2012. Now the key thing here is that um, the Mayans, like many civilizations after them, realized that things going on in the sky uh, are predictable. There is a periodic behavior of uh, celestial phenomena and of course the most obvious one is the regular rising and setting of the sun uh, every 24 hours, uh, the moon waxes and wanes over a month uh, and of course the seasons come and go with a period of a year and so astronomical phenomena are characterized by regular phenomena that uh, surely has a deeper understanding and of course the deeper understanding comes from the laws of physics in particular Newton's law of gravitation uh, which came of course long after the Mayans figured out these periodic uh, motions and encoded them into their calendar and in fact uh, nature has been a little bit unkind to us uh, because uh, a lot of these cycles don't fit together very nicely. So for example, there are not exactly 12 cycles of the moon uh, in one year. There's 365 and a quarter days in a year and juggling all these uh, irregular numbers and sorting out a nice calendar has been uh, subject to many attempts by humanity uh, through the millennia. And we're very used to the fact that when one cycle comes to an end, another cycle starts. So when the cycle called December 10 comes to an end as it will at midnight tonight, the next cycle, December 11, will begin and there's no big deal at midnight uh, when the new cycle begins. And so indeed when the 5,125 year uh, long cycle of the Mayan calendar comes to an end on December 21, 2012, the next cycle will begin at midnight as you would expect. So I don't see any reason to expect the world will end at that date. Uh, however, there are a few other things uh, that could trigger the end of the world and the world did end 65 million years ago for the dinosaurs and I say lucky for us because if that hadn't have happened, uh, I'd be standing here with a long scaly tail and green a scaly skin and little dinosaur eyes uh, giving this talk and it would not be mammals who had uh, taken the leading uh, position in the ecosystem. Uh, so that could happen again. And indeed, if you look at the evidence uh, throughout the geological record, there are repeated examples of major meteorite impacts that did uh, kill off a lot of the flora and fauna of the time uh, and set uh, uh, the evolution of the, the animals and the plants on this planet on a new path because only those that survived the catastrophe uh, carried on. Um, but 
What's a little bit different about today is that with our technology, we could see this coming and could possibly do something about it. So here's uh, an artist's impression. I find this a little chilling uh, of the uh, 65 million year old event when the uh, meteorite, uh, big meteorite impacted in what is now uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in uh, Mexico and triggered a, a, a decade or more of very uh, cold, if indeed uh, very uh, freezing winters that killed off, it would seem, uh, the dinosaurs, although still a little bit of uncertainty about whether there, was, there were massive volcanic eruptions that could have also done this. But if we saw a meteorite uh, capable of this sort of planet changing uh, catastrophe coming, there were things that we could do with modern technology if we had enough notice. So uh, this is an artist's impression of a uh, iron rocket uh, attached uh, to one of these asteroids that was detected uh, in plenty of time. This is a near-Earth object and indeed um, in the uh, catalogues of uh, planetary objects there are many of these whose orbits are tracked with great precision uh, so that we can see if any of them are likely to be dangerous and it, it may be feasible uh, to do something about it if we discovered one on a collision course with Earth in the future. Although you have to be careful what you did uh, you wouldn't want to do the Hollywood version of uh, lifting up a few gung-ho astro jocks with nuclear bombs to try and deflect it or destroy it because you could just as easily make the situation worse uh, as well as making it better. So a gentle approach, uh, an iron engine powered by solar power uh, spitting out high speed ions of xenon or uh, mercury uh, like the ones that the uh, Japanese and the Americans have pioneered for deep space missions might be the way to go. It would be, however, very expensive. Another option, by the way, might be just to paint one side of the asteroid white and use the pressure of sunlight to deflect the asteroid, uh, asteroid from the collision. Uh, it's a very gentle pressure provided by sunlight. You'd have to do that well in advance, but that might be a low-tech solution to the problem. So let's cross that one out as well. Uh, my colleagues uh, are very involved with the CERN particle accelerator and we are eagerly awaiting the first signals of black holes being created artificially in this machine. This would be an enormous scientific breakthrough and of course there's been a lot of press about these black holes falling into the earth and gobbling up the planet uh, and so that could be another candidate for causing the end of the world. Now personally I'm not worried uh, because um, we, and, and nor should you, when you think about it, where in this room is gravity the strongest? And the answer is right there, on the surface of our planet. Everywhere else nearby, gravity is weaker. As you move away from the surface of the planet, gravity falls off, the strength of gravity falls off as one over the square of the distance you are from the centre of the Earth. And if you drill down Below the surface, gravity falls off as one on R because as you go down below the surface, you're starting to get matter above you pulling you up along with the matter below you pulling you down. And so as eventually if you reach the centre of the Earth, uh, gravity has gone to zero. So the strongest gravitational pull is on the surface of an object. You can't make it any stronger. There could be a way of making the gravity stronger by compressing the Earth into a smaller volume so that you can get closer to the matter of the Earth and therefore you'd feel a stronger gravitational pull. Now, we have in our bodies a large number of subatomic particles called electrons. Electrons, fundamental particle of matter, they're very light but they're very tiny. And in fact, the, the, the electron itself, ignoring quantum mechanics, may be a dimensionless object. It may be infinitely tiny and it's just a little knot of electric field. This means you could, in principle, get as close as you liked to an electron where you would find the gravitational pull was enormous. Because remember, the gravitational field goes as 1 over, the gravitational uh, force goes as 1 over r squared, the distance you are from the electron, and you make r as small as you like, the field will go as strong as you like. And I personally, personally am not afraid of falling in to the gravitational field of the electrons in my body and disappearing in a puff of smoke. Likewise, small black holes being made at CERN will have the same 
situation. They're very, very tiny. The gravity is only strong when you're really close to them, when you're far from them, and you will always be far from them because they're so tiny. They don't go around gobbling things up. The gravity is no more strong than the gravity from an electron is strong. So don't be afraid of falling into the electrons in your own body or indeed into any artificial black holes that are made at CERN, which would have a very short life anyway from Hawking radiation. OK, so on now to the main part of my lecture and talking about how Galileo transformed our uh, view of the universe and put the study of those long periods that the Mayans detected and many people did uh, since onto a firm scientific and indeed physical footing. Uh, so I wanted to start with this image. I'm sure many of you have seen this, but this is an image of our solar system taken from outside, taken from out in space, in interstellar space, looking back at our solar system. So this was done by the Voyager 1 probe um, that's been on its way now for some 40 odd years. Uh, this was the last image it took before it switched off the camera forever because it's where it's going there's nothing more to photograph. And it made this mosaic of images. The sun has been blanked out because otherwise it would have been hopelessly overexposed. And you can just see in one pixel of the image that was radioed back this planet. Our entire planet just covers one pixel of the image. Everything you've ever known or done or lived is in that faint white dot seen from the edges of the solar system. Venus likewise is uh, just barely visible in close around the Sun and as you go out there's a dot for Saturn. Uh, Jupiter is over here somewhere, Uranus and indeed the star of today's show, the planet Neptune. More on that later. So I find this rather evocative to look back on our solar system from outside. No human, of course, had ever seen this before. This image was radioed back in 1999. So anyway, let's begin with the uh, universe as it was before Galileo. It was the Earth-centered universe, with the Earth at the center of the universe and everything orbiting around it. Now, this model has some serious difficulties because it doesn't account even for the naked eye observations of the sky. It's very difficult to explain the way Mercury and Venus behave just that you can see with the naked eye with this model. Uh, nevertheless, the evidence of our senses tell us that we are clearly at rest. We're sitting here perfectly relaxed and comfortable at rest. That is common sense. So if you're going to displace the Earth from the centre of the universe and set it in motion, you need to have a very good physical reason for why we don't perceive the motion of the Earth with our own senses. So the laws of physics have to be developed in parallel with any modification of the geocentric model of the solar system. This fact is often overlooked. So there is the Sun orbiting the Earth on its crystalline sphere. So what did Galileo do to that common sense model of the solar system? The answer is he blew it away completely. Understanding the physical basis for all those long cycles and the many and varied cycles that go on in the sky, understanding it on a firm scientific basis started with Galileo. Now, uh, this is a photograph, uh, and here are the tools of the trade uh, in making this, uh, uh, developing this understanding, making the discoveries. Uh, this is a photograph taken in April of this year. There are two very important tools of Galileo's trade in this image. The first is the objective lens that was in his telescope that made the observations I'm going to present to you in a moment. The second is the bone from his right index finger. And so this illustrates two things. First of all, the manual dexterity that Galileo had. He was a very skilled instrument maker. For 20 years after he made the telescope that incorporated that lens, no one else could make lenses and telescopes of sufficient quality to see the things that he saw because his unique manual skills at grinding lenses to unprecedented precision. I think this must have fallen out of the coffin when they moved him. More on that later. 
And here is indeed the telescope that he used, not a replica, uh, in the display case in the Museum of Science in Florence. Now, um, what I tried to do is reproduce that telescope here tonight. I ordered from the uh, Mellers Grio optics catalogue uh, the modern lens is as close as possible to the ones that Galileo made. Of course, his were handmade and weren't, you know, 1.0 metres in focal length and so on and so forth. But this is a very close approximation, at least optically, to the telescope he used. Unfortunately, I can't quite bring it into focus in the small confines of the lecture hall here, but later on you could take it outside and try it on the sky if you wanted to. But it's actually not a very good telescope, but it was the first telescope and therefore when he turned it to the sky for the first time he made astounding discoveries. Now I have a slight connection with Galileo, not Galileo the man, but Galileo the spacecraft. I was a postdoctoral research fellow in the United States and after the Challenger disaster the uh, Galileo space pro probe was brought back from Cape Canaveral and rejigged in the um, clean rooms in the Jet Propulsion Labs and I went up and visited it while that was happening before it was finally launched uh, on a, a, an ordinary rocket instead of the space shuttle. So this is the main chassis of the uh, Galileo probe uh, being uh, reassembled. This is what it looks like when it was completely rebuilt and the atoms of this spacecraft are now dispersed in the atmosphere of Jupiter. When its mission finished and the radio generators the radioisotope generators finally went flat. It was deliberately uh, dropped into the uh, Jovian atmosphere to prevent it colliding with any of the moons of Jupiter, which could perhaps one day have life, perhaps not as we know it, but life nevertheless on them, and they didn't want to contaminate them with possible microbes that had somehow survived the hard radiation of the Jupiter environs for a decade. Uh, so better to drop it into Jupiter than to risk it colliding with one of the moons. Uh, so that was 1987. So Galileo the man um, started his career in Pisa, then moved to Padua in 1592, and then finally to Florence in 1610. He was a professor actually of mathematics, uh, not of physics, but after he became famous, uh, he entered into the employ of the Medicis uh, and was able to give up his teaching program. He corresponded Frequently, and in the pre-internet age, it's extraordinary how often he wrote and received letters from Johannes Kepler, who was his contemporary based in either Tübingen or Prague in Central Europe. And we'll get back to the correspondence between Galileo and Kepler in a moment. Anyway, the telescope and the remarkable observations from 400 years ago were done uh, with the, uh, I think, of the smaller of these telescopes, the times 20 magnification. He tried to uh, go beyond that, but the uh, lenses were not good enough. It didn't improve the seeing. He, I get the impression from reading Galileo's letters and his books that he was not a man who suffered fools gladly. And when he saw something and he latched onto it and became an authority on it because he studied it relentlessly, night after night after night, writing down his observations, people who was not as quick on the uptake as he uh, would tend to be, he would get, uh, he would give them somewhat abrasive treatment. And that's okay if you're doing that to a fellow physicist, perhaps, that you're trying to convince of the validity of your observations. It would not be sensible to do that in your correspondence with the Pope. And I think Galileo did not endear himself to the hierarchy with the forthright nature of his uh, correspondence. But anyway, after uh, developing the, uh, the, the telescope, pointing it to the sky, he had a frenzied period of activity between November of 1609 and March of 1610, writing down his observations and publishing them for the first time in this little book. And if you look at this little book, the last page of observations that appears in the book uh, uh, was, were, were done just a week before the publication date. So you can imagine the publisher is running the presses, uh, in a manner of speaking, you know, uh, press, uh, printing the book and begging Galileo to please send him the last page so it can hit the, uh, hit the uh, newsstands, hit the book rooms. And people knew this was coming. People on March 13 when this appeared, people were queuing up to buy it. And one of the first customers was the British ambassador, Sir Henry Wootton, 
to the Republic of Venice, who grabbed a copy on the same day it was published and sent it to King James I of England, saying this is the strangest piece of news ever yet received from any part of the world. So startling were the observations. So what were the observations? Well, remarkably, the moon appeared to have topography like the earth, mountains, valleys, plains, and Galileo's sketches dramatically reveal uh, what, he, what he saw. We don't know exactly what he was looking at. None of these features appear to match precisely with the modern moon maps, but it, it gives a nevertheless a dramatic illustration that this heavenly body was not a perfect sphere as uh, had been suggested that anything in the heaven has to be in the heavens has to be perfect, but this was not perfect. It had imperfections, mountains, valleys, plains, just like the Earth. Also, by looking at the Pleiades, uh, he saw something like 28 new stars that you could see through the telescope that you could not see with the unaided eye. This was very, very startling to see so many new stars never recorded before by the human eye. Even worse was the sun had numerous imperfections and Galileo had an ingenious method for projecting the image of the sun uh, on a piece of cardboard whereupon he could sketch it in safety and saw the sunspots for the first time. Although the, he had a long dispute with a rival astronomer who claimed to have seen them before Galileo. So imperfections on the sun must have been a very uncomfortable sight. But the most dramatic observations were the ones he made of the planet Jupiter because he discovered that in orbit around Jupiter were these four Medician stars, as he called them, now known as the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Ganymede, Callisto, Io and Europa. And he thought when he saw these for the first time in November of 1609 that by coincidence Jupiter was drifting past a patch of sky that happened to have four stars in a row. The next night he found the four stars were still there but in different places but still close to Jupiter. And night after night after night for about four years every night he was out there recording the position of these four little stars relative to Jupiter. An extraordinary intensity with which he observed these new stars and eventually he realised that these were in orbit around Jupiter and for the first time in, uh, sorry, for the first observed in January 7th of 1610, all four were safely down in his notebooks by January 16 and he figured out that they were in orbit around Jupiter, not Earth. So for the first time, concrete irrefutable evidence written in the sky for anyone to see with a telescope were objects that were orbiting an object other than the Earth which was supposed to be at the centre of the universe. So the geocentric model of the solar system was immediately in trouble right here. Even more puzzling, uh, observations of Saturn revealed a planet that appeared to have two giant ears sticking out the side of the planet. Uh, Galileo at first thought these were two gigantic moons, but they didn't seem to change in position. But what was perplexing that a few years after he first observed them, they disappeared entirely as Earth passed through the plane of the rings in its orbit around the Sun and, and uh, Saturn's orbit. And it took a long time before people uh, finally figured out the true nature of the Saturnian system. Venus was a real puzzle. Venus displayed phases like the moon and I'm sure many of you have looked through binoculars at the planet Venus and seen these phases for yourself. It's a beautiful and dramatic sight. Um, and the only way you can explain the, way, the changing shape and size of Venus is if Venus was in orbit around the Sun and not in orbit <coughs> around the Earth. So having made this dramatic discovery of the phases of Venus that no one had ever reported before, Galileo wanted to be famous and to be known as the discoverer of the phases of Venus. So how do you reveal to people that you've just discovered something dramatic so you don't get gazumped by someone else with a half-baked telescope who beats you into publication first? What you do is you encode your discovery in an anagram and send it to a trusted colleague with a stamp, a postmark on the letter, establishing your precedence for the discovery of this remarkable phenomenon. So sure enough, 
In uh, July, on July 25th of 1610, or shortly thereafter, Johannes Kepler received the first anagram from Galileo. Now this drove Kepler absolutely nuts. Galileo knew Galileo, uh, sorry, Kepler knew Galileo had invented this telescope and was discovering fantastic things in the skies for the first time. Kepler wanted desperately to know what this meant and he dropped everything and spent weeks and weeks trying to decode it and got it wrong. But Galileo needed time. He needed time and in this case the anagram uh, refers to the uh, discovery of the um, uh, rings of Saturn. Uh, he needed time to keep observing uh, Saturn in this case to try and figure out this strange appearance of the planet and try and explain it. So he didn't want to reveal the discovery immediately until he understood it. But he, he didn't and eventually he relented and revealed to Kepler that this is what uh, the anagram, uh, when rearranged correctly in Latin, actually says, which translated into English it says, I have observed the highest of the planets, which in those days was Saturn, three formed, thus revealing the discovery of these two big ears sticking out the side. Getting back to Venus now. Uh, <laughs> Understanding that the phases of Venus meant that it was orbiting the Sun and not the Earth, he sent the second anagram to Kepler, which also, uh, this time it sort of means something. I don't know what that translates to into uh, English, but it's, uh, it's a red herring. But when you rearrange the words, it, it translates to this. Rearrange the letters, sorry, it, you get this, which translates to the mother of love imitates the shape of Cynthia. Now, you know, People did physics in a different way in those days. I'd love to have a statement like that in one of my modern scientific papers. I don't think the editor would let it through. But by the mother of love, of course, uh, Galileo is referring to Venus, and by Cynthia, his, he means the moon. So here he was safely able to reveal his, the, uh, get precedence for his discovery without giving anything away while he studied the phenomenon further to try and understand it. I'll come to a third anagram at the end of the lecture. Now, I uh, became very interested in Galileo's observations about uh, 20 years ago. And uh, fortunately, most of his uh, notebook, well, sorry, not most, half of his notebook has been digitized and put online. And I recommend it to you. It's fascinating to look at the pictures and to see what he's written, mostly in uh, Latin. But in April of this year, I had an extraordinary opportunity to go to Florence, go in through those same doors I showed you before without having to shout and carry on this time, and be ushered through the closed section and out the back into the rare manuscript stack. And when I got there, into my shaking hands was placed Galileo's original astronomical notebooks. Not a copy, the actual books that Galileo had written in 400 years ago. And this was an enormous privilege and an enormous thrill. And here's me studying them with my specially made magnifying glass that I bought with me from Melbourne. So I'd like to now tell you what I was looking for at first hand in the original notebooks of Galileo. I want to go back to this, the nights of December of 1612. Here's a representative page from uh, December 28, here's a line indicating the click over to 1613, and here's now observations for the first part of January of 1613. So here's December 28, 1612, through to the first days of January 1613. And you can see Galileo has drawn, if I can zoom in for a close-up, um, I'll get to that in a moment, he has drawn uh, uh, a line here and he's put Jupiter uh, as he saw it through his telescope, and he's recorded the positions of the four moons, his personal space here, orbiting Jupiter. And he's recorded the position of the moons in units of the diameter of Jupiter that he could see through the telescope. So they're very good quantitative observations, and night after night, from when he discovered them in 1609 right through to 16, 16 or 17, he recorded what he saw. And you can see from the vigour with which he wrote, you know, he was very passionate, he was obsessed with this. And he was also a very careful observer. 
He's tracking Jupiter as it drifts across the sky with his telescope, night after night. And occasionally, stars would drift through the field of view as he's tracking Jupiter as it moves against the fixed stars. And he would conscientiously record those stars whenever he saw them appear in the same field of view. And indeed, over here in the margins on this uh, uh, same uh, night of December 28, 1612, here you see he's put a dot which he's labelled fixer, that is to say fixed star. And he's drawn a dotted line indicating the direction of the fixed star that he'd seen on this night when he was observing Jupiter. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that when we look in the star charts and run the planetarium simulation for the night of December 28, 1612, there is no such star in the star catalogues. Let's wind forward to January 6th of 1613. And to see this image, you have to look at the original manuscript because this object here has been airbrushed out of the copies that appear online because the publisher thought it was a blemish. Once again, January 6, 1613, we see Jupiter. We see the four Galilean moons, as we call them now. Careful recording of the distances. And an, a mysterious object recorded here. Unlabeled. No such star appeared in that spot on the night of January the 6th of 1613. Could this just be a random ink smudge or is it something new? Let's go forward to January 28 of 1613 and try and solve this puzzle. This is the most extraordinary observation in my view in the whole book, with one possible exception. Again, he's drawn Jupiter and he's drawn the little dots representing the positions of the moons. And here there's an extraordinary dotted line, uh, 29 Jovian diameters as seen through the eyepiece, labelled A. And indeed, when you look up the star charts, this is star SAO 119234. It exists in the modern star charts. But down here, there's a little inset. A little inset, again showing star A, and a further object, even more uh, remote from uh, Jupiter, but along the same line, that is labelled B. No such object exists in any star chart. To help you see this, I've used Photoshop to reassemble the diagram if the page had been wide enough. Now, what does Galileo say about this object B? It's encoded down here. In Latin, when translated, he says, star B, fixer B, seem to appear more distant from one another, that is to say, star A, on this night, compared to what it was on the previous night. In other words, Galileo has recorded in his notebook that he had seen object B move in a period of only 24 hours. Now, ladies and gentlemen, only one class of object moves in a space of 24 hours visible through a Galilean telescope. This is Galileo making his observations. We think the true method by which he was able to make these very accurate quantitative observations has been lost, but we believe he looked through the telescope with one eye and with the other eye he sighted on a grid which could be moved backwards and forwards until Jupiter fitted very nicely into one of the periods of the grid and then he was able to read off uh, the positions of the, uh, the other objects. Um, so, in order to try and figure out what this mysterious B was, it's time to go to the computer and run the simulations. Maybe I could take the lights completely off for this because you won't be able to see the uh, subtle details. Ah, ah, it's just like being outside. So this is a Stellarium for the night of December 28, 1612, the first observations I presented to you. And if I superimpose onto this diagram Galileo's notebook, we can see very nicely the accurate alignment between the modern simulation and the positions of the four Galilean moons on this night. And we see 
If we follow this dotted line out, in the simulation there is indeed an object out here. But it is not a star. And when we ask the program, what the heck is that? And you've got to keep it in mind, a Galilean telescope has a very small field of view. So that's all the sky that Galileo could see. He must have panned away from Jupiter into the inky blackness surrounding the planet to look for things that were invisible to the naked eye in order to observe this object. So the computer, when asked, what is it, reveals, yes, that's where it is. It is indeed the planet Neptune. Eighth magnitude, 234 years before it was officially discovered. Recorded in the pages of Galileo's notebook. Invisible to the naked eye, he must have been looking for it. Why else would you pan away from the familiar neighbourhood of Jupiter and its moons out several diameters of your field of view to record this object? Fast forward, January 6, 1613. Again, the Stellarium simulation shows a remarkable correspondence between Galileo's observations and indeed this mysterious and unlabeled spot is almost exactly where Neptune was on that night. Why isn't it labeled Fixer? Did he know it wasn't a fixed star? Let's fast forward to the fateful night of January 28, 1613. Again, we see the extraordinarily good correspondence between the positions of the moons and Galileo's notebook. And sure enough, over here, we see star SAO 119234 and indeed object B, which he recorded as having seen, been seen to move, is indeed the planet Neptune. So Galileo was a very smart guy. He's just seen an object that looks like a star move. He's been recording its position over a month, even though it was outside of the field of view that he was using for his telescope to observe Jupiter and its moons. He was watching it. Is there any evidence in his notebooks that he knew he had just discovered a new planet, the first planet ever discovered by humanity since deep antiquity. A planet for which there was no precedent in the classical literature. Why wouldn't he have told somebody? Maybe he did. I would speculate, I did speculate, that Galileo did indeed know that this was a new planet. And when he saw it move on January 28, 1613, and indeed recorded that he'd seen it move, he leafed back through his notebooks, sorry, he leafed back through his notebooks to where he'd seen it before on the night of January 6, three weeks earlier. And Galileo often wrote down observations from memory and recorded this dot which he did not label. So I formed the theory that maybe the ink in this dot had the same chemical composition of the ink from January 28 and not the chemical composition of the ink from January 6. Now, for the benefit of the young people in the audience, that means anyone under 50, yeah. once upon a time, people wrote with ink. And when I say ink, I mean ink in an ink well with a pen that you had to dip into the well and load your pen with ink and then write on the page. And I have the honour of being the last ink monitor at the primary school I attended in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. After me, the 2,000-year-old tradition of filling the ink wells in the morning so that the scholars would have ink for their work during the day came to a dead end. Now, what's in those ink wells that I had to fill up with a big jug of ink every morning? All sorts of garbage. And Galileo used to make his own ink, grinding it up in a mortar and pestle, add water, and that mortar and pestle was used for all sorts of unspeakable things when it wasn't being used to grind up the ink. The composition of Galileo's ink changed on a daily basis. And we have Galileo's checkbook with the dates in it, and we know the chemical composition of the ink he used every day. 
So could we analyse the chemical composition of that dot to try and understand whether this was a retrospective entry from January 28 when he realised he had seen a planet and could this be evidence of what he was thinking? That is what took me to Florence in April of this year. That's what I was doing with my magnifying glass looking at this mysterious unlabeled dot. He didn't label it fixer because by then he was already thinking this is not a fixer, this is a planet. That's my hypothesis. These are images of the dot taken in visible light, infrared and uh, uh, different wavelengths of infrared to try and figure out uh, whether it was ink or not. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough volume of material in that mysterious dot to do the chemical analysis I had in mind, proton-induced X-ray emission using a nuclear microprobe and an external beam, never mind the technical details. But I feel there may be some other evidence hidden in Galileo's notebooks that is there still to be found. But let's consider why Galileo really didn't announce that he'd seen a new planet. First of all, he was already starting to get in trouble with the Inquisition. He was already told to be careful and more respectful in the way he interacted with the authorities of the day. This is Galileo facing the Inquisition in 1633 when they're asking him to recant his observations. You can't do that. The observations were there for everyone to see and the evidence that the Earth orbited the Sun was overwhelming. And I've been practicing this pose for when I've been fronting the Dean over budget problems in the School of <laughs> Physics. Uh, it's proved to be very useful. <laughs> but you can imagine the reaction if he said, oh, by the way, not only did I see the phases of Venus, the rings of Saturn, new stars that no one had ever seen before, I also found a new planet. You can imagine how that would have gone down. Particularly since once Neptune drifted away from the vicinity of uh, Jupiter, it could never be found again. People didn't have the orbital elements or the planetarium simulation program. If you can't see it with the unaided eye, how would you know where to point your telescope? It would not be possible for someone else to confirm the discovery. And you've got to remember with physics and with science, the data is in nature. It's not on the authority of the scientist. It has to be reproducible. It has to be objective. And so maybe that's why, first of all, it was too dangerous to announce it. Second of all, he couldn't provide the, the coordinates for someone else to follow up his discovery. So before I give you the last anagram, in my view, Galileo's notebooks that I had in my hands for two precious and forever memorable hours represent one of the greatest artefacts of our civilization. Because before those notebooks, it was the medieval world, the world of received wisdom, of the, of the great books to which nothing could be added. But after Galileo made these observations, where the heavens laid open to anybody who had the right telescope and the eyes to see it, the world changed. The geocentric model of the solar system collapsed because it was not compatible with the observations that anyone could make. And we entered into a new world where you would see for yourself. And that has brought in Western civilization that you see around you. So here is Neptune as seen from Voyager. Finally officially discovered in 1846 by a telescope based on theoretical predictions using Newton's laws of gravity to pick it up because you can't see it with the unaided eye. But I'd put it to you that this was first discovered in 1612 by someone who knew what he was seeing. So I regard this time when Galileo made that dot and lifted his pen from the page to be the end of the medieval world. That instant is the start of the modern world and the way we do things today based on science, observation, theory, testing. But here, I believe, is the evidence that I need to find to reveal what was going on in Galileo's mind that night, January 28 of 1613. 
I've shown you two anagrams that he sent to Kepler, revealing his discoveries while keeping them secret. I believe, never mind chemical analysis of the black dot, but I believe there is still an anagram to be discovered in Galileo's correspondence, possibly with Kepler, that has yet to be decoded. And if it was decoded, it would reveal the discovery of the new planet. I've been searching feverishly in Melbourne online and in Florence with the actual notebooks for that anagram. I regret to say, ladies and gentlemen, I have not yet found it. So this all remains in the world of speculation. And because I couldn't find the anagram, I made one up myself. <laughs> and here it is at the end of my talk. This actually does mean something. If you translate into English, it says, I boldly follow the path even though scared. How appropriate. But what does it really mean? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Uh, no, I believe he used uh, Tycho Brahe's uh, observations, the uh, naked eye observations that have been recorded for um, decades uh, in order to uncover the Kepler laws. Yeah, but They were purely empirical, that is to say there was no underlying physical theory, it was a mathematical model that explained what was going on, provided you had the heliocentric model of the solar system. And in fact, uh, Galileo was instructed to be clear in his literature that this was a mathematical convenience that had no connection to reality, except that it always gave the right answer. <laughs> but, I've got a question there yeah. for you. How did you get onto this? <laughs> what made you pursue it? Okay, when I, when I was a young lad, is, can we turn the tape off on this? Uh, just, okay, no, you can keep it. <laughs> um, when I was a young lad, uh, I was uh, uh, always very interested in science, and I used to... Uh, always read Scientific American. And in 1980, when I was very much younger than I am now, there was an article in Scientific American identifying that mysterious dot as Neptune. So that wasn't my discovery. Uh, so the guy who discovered it um, actually had a job at the Jet Propulsion Lab plotting the trajectory of spacecraft through the solar system. And so he had developed back in the 80s a very accurate mathematical model to enable him to trace Voyager and Pioneer and Mariner and the Apollo spacecraft and all of that through the solar system with high precision using Newton's law of gravity. And Newton's laws work perfectly for the solar system for everything except the planet Mercury. Mercury dances to a slightly different tune to the one Newton laid down. You need Einstein to explain Mercury. But anyway, and so he was the guy who discovered this when he, he realised that uh, over history there was only a couple of times when two planets passed each other in the field of view of a small telescope. And when he discovered that Neptune passed Jupiter in 1612 uh, and 1613, he looked up how many people were looking at the sky through small telescopes at that year. Well, there was only one. So he just went to the library, opened the book at the date, bingo, there was Neptune. Um, that was 1980, and um, when I was preparing uh, this uh, lecture for 2009, I revisited that story because it's nearly 400 years old, and then it occurred to me, after uh, corresponding with some colleagues in Florence who'd done the analysis of the checkbook, that maybe that could reveal uh, the answer as to whether he knew he'd seen a planet or not. And when you look at Galileo's books up close, you see the vigour and the passion that he put into recording his observations and the assertiveness with which he was putting his mark on this patch of sky, it seems incredible that he didn't come to the realisation he'd just seen a new planet. I can imagine on that night of January 28, 16, 13, recoiling from the eyepiece of the telescope, oh, I've got to tell someone. And, uh, mm, uh, no, uh, no, I better not.
get the anagram maker out and get an anagram off to Kepler right away. Uh, and then he searched, I reckon he searched for weeks afterwards when it finally <laughs> drifted far from the field of view, trying to recover it again to plot the trajectory, but the notebooks are silent on that object after January 28 of 1613 when it had drifted far from the position of Jupiter. Well, yeah, well, yeah, well that's, that's, that's a very good question. And In my view, Galileo was a very good scientist, probably the first very good scientist the world has ever seen, and he realised that you couldn't announce an observation that no one could follow up. Otherwise, it's just like writing poetry. You have to have it followed up. And that's why he sent these anagrams off, because he knew he had to, uh, it, when he revealed it, everybody would turn their telescopes to those objects to follow up his observations. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think he didn't announce it, because it would discredit him if no one could find Neptune again as it drifted away. And he probably thought very hard, I'm sure he thought very hard, about how he should reveal this if, he, if it couldn't be followed up, and in the end decided not to. Other Galilean scholars, well, I'm not a Galilean scholar, but professional Galilean scholars speculate that he was distracted with other things. There were so many things going on in the eyepiece of his telescope that he just didn't have time to come back to it. I don't believe it. Galileo, new planet, get out of here. <laughs> he probably obsessed about it every night for the next 40 years until he died, trying to find it again, I would say. <laughs> just look at the vigour with which he put those dots on the page and he wrote those words and the cross, impatient crossing outs, positions uncertain because of clouds. You know, he was trying to see through the clouds to follow this thing. He was driven to find new things. Um, you say uh, that the technology you used uh, couldn't, there was, wasn't enough room to analyse. Can you see any, you know, down the track future technologies that would enable you to do that? I know, I mean, for example, you can amplify DNA using PCR. Is there some sort of technique using nanotechnology you could use to amplify? Yes, yes. I, uh, you could uh, actually use a different method to the one I was thinking of using that would probably give you higher sensitivity, but it still wouldn't give you a clear and unambiguous answer. It would, it would certainly, if you could get enough uh, precision in the measurement, confirm whether the ink dot was contemporary with uh, January 8 or whether it was contemporary with January 28, sorry, January 6 or January 28. But you still wouldn't know what Galileo was thinking. And it might reveal it not to be ink after all. It could be a splash of 400-year-old spaghetti bolognese. I mean, that's, <laughs> but it certainly looks like ink with the different wavelengths of light. And with my um, giant magnifying glass, it sure as hell looked like uh, ink. Do you have any thoughts on the approximations or estimations of how many people would have had telescopes around that time who would be actually looking up the information that Galileo had published? Uh, I think in 1609 the number of people who had telescopes capable of making the observations I've described tonight was one, and that was Galileo. But he, uh, you know, when this, when this book hit the press, it created a sensation. It instantly made Galileo famous, and the demand for copies of his telescope became prodigious and it really started driving him nuts, grinding lenses day after day. But he had to do it to earn a living, right? Uh, and other people would complain that they'd ordered the best quality telescope from their local lens maker and it was rubbish. They couldn't see. You know, it was all fuzzy, chromatic aberration, uh, spherical aberration. They couldn't see what he had seen. Please send me one of your telescopes so I can see with my own eyes. And as I mentioned, I think for some 20 years after 1609, you had to order a telescope from Galileo to get the, the quality. Yeah, good question. I don't know for sure. Uh, I know that um, he used to order uh, hundreds of um, uh, uh, glass vases like this, which he would then smash. Uh, so that you've got uh, a curved surface to start with, and then he would go and grind it and look at it, grind it, look at it, grind at it, until he, until he figured it uh, as carefully as he could. So something you couldn't be doing overnight? No, it would not be overnight. I think doing things by hand to this precision, and the professional uh, optical analysis of his uh, lenses show them to be of remarkably good quality. They did have a strong greenish tinge from iron contamination, in the glass and there were often little bubbles here and there and he'd often complain uh, that he'd have to throw these away because of defects in the glass.
And, and in practice, he didn't use the telescope without a collimator over the front. So the, the lenses here are good enough that you can see things without a collimator, but he would often collimate the objective down to just, say, a centimetre or so. And he experimented with elliptical collimators, which he'd rotate and try and find the best bits of glass to get the sharpest image. So it wasn't trivial. There was a lot of things had to come together. Well, um, I'd like to thank you all for having us tonight and thank you for coming. And, um, and especially thanks, Dave, for stepping in in the absence of Jocelyn. And um, I'd like to put your hands together and thank Dave. Thank you. Thank you very much.